Hello everyone, so today we are going to talk about this amazing topic of inclusion and diversity in the workplace, but not only, we are going to talk about our customers and what people do around the world about that. And I have an amazing panel around me to talk about this great topic. Uh, so why don't we start by hearing from you and letting you introduce yourself. Who wants to start? I have three amazing ladies. Hey Masha, do you want to start as you have uh, the remote access? So maybe we can start with you today. Sure, no problem. Uh, my name is Emisha Graham. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I'm dialing in today from Milton, Ontario, Canada, which is on the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, as well as the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee and Huron-Wendat peoples. I'm the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Manager for Flight Center Travel Group Americas. I'm so grateful to be included in today's panel. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. Okay, and here we have two amazing ladies. So, who wants to start? So, uh, I'm Bodin Monson. I am the MD of the Nordics of FCN. And I have uh, been working there for almost seven years now. It's an amazing uh, situation we are in with all the different changes happening. And also now talking a lot about uh, diversity and inclusive. And I'm Naomi Dias. I identify by the pronouns she, her, and I look after account management in India. And we are sitting here in Rio. I'm wearing the colors of this yeah. beautiful country. And this is, of course, the Indian sari with the theme of diversity and inclusion. Um, I will be talking about, you know, the Asia challenges and the good news that is coming up um, in our region and excited to be here. Thanks for being here. And so my name is Bertrand and um, my pronouns is he, him. Um, I am actually um, gay and I like talking about that because being a gay leader in Asia, because this is where I'm based in Singapore, um, it's not always easy, but I want to make sure that we take our people through um, the freedom of being who they are. And I think this is an essential part of what we should do as leaders in our business. So before um, going into everyone's particular can you just tell me quickly what do you think is the situation in your respective region about diversity inclusion like is this a topic that you hear about do you see things happening around that so what's the situation why don't we start with you naomi so bertrand as you know in asia largely the stories it's patriarchal hierarchical uh, a lot of orthodox mindsets and it's largely all true yes uh, but things are changing, uh, they are bound to change, uh, largely because again, there are a lot of MNC customers in you know, uh, intrigued about the region, they're trying to expand their base, and in alignment with how the MNCs think, uh, there has to be progress, that is one. Secondly, the governments are understanding in terms of you know, the whole LG LGBT mindsets that people need more freedom, they need to be who they are, as you rightly said. Uh, so that's also changing. It's a very interesting uh, time to be in. And this is across the region. Right? I think Singapore is far more forward. Uh, so is Hong Kong, uh, India, Japan, China. Lots, lots more to be done, honestly. And um, I think from the whole corporate travel space, maybe leisure is far more you know, different. But in the corporate travel space, uh, most of our stakeholders have not even been have not even started on diversity and inclusion from the travel perspective. As a business, uh, the leaders, yes, they understand the need, uh, but travel managers today honestly do not know where to start and how to start. Uh, that's because, again, most uh, people are not very open for yeah. fear of being, uh, you know, stereotyped. So it's a conservative or culture, basically. Absolutely. Yeah. So if the people are not open, therefore there's no one fighting for it. And in the business travel space, it's not really on the table yet. But like we saw with sustainability, it has started. And if it started now, it will only snowball into something. And exciting. for you as a woman in leadership in India, how do you find it working? So. So for just to give you an example of me, before coming here, I had to make sure all the household stuff is in order. It still happens, it still works. Uh, we don't necessarily have the support structure in space, uh, in place at the moment. And um, from the work perspective, Bertra, it's honestly not easy. Um, every day you face something, what you call microaggressions. Uh, you're being talked down to, uh, you're being told how to manage, how to behave, um, how to think, how to talk at times, right? Um, and all we need to do is probably 
claw onto that space, right? You know, you, you work much harder and you let, you know, you can't make blind people see, so you let some things go and just stay focused. And I have champions like you, I have champions in India, I have, I have Rakesh, I have Scott, um, you know, who really are there to stand by you, right? So that's, that's what honestly most women need. We don't need, um, you know, mentorship is great, but having someone to champion for you, um, I think that is definitely what we need more of in Asia. Yeah, that's very interesting. So basically what you are saying is that you have two jobs between the family <laughs> one and the professional one. Yes. And on top of that, you have very little support to actually do your job, which Absolutely. is quite sad to hear. But anyway, <laughs> so we have some more work to do in that space. What about you, Bodil, in the Nordics? So uh, in the Nordics, uh, contrary, we have very flat organizations. Uh, everyone is treated equal. It's almost like in our spine. It's how we grow up and, and uh, uh, to give everyone the same opportunity. But that also brings, maybe we are a bit naive. So we talk a lot about what's visible, but maybe not what isn't visible. So it's actually not that big on a, the agenda today because it's more like we don't need to talk about it because it's you know self-explaining. But I think we also forget that it's great to be in the Nordics, but we send travelers around the world. And then maybe it's not that great any longer. And if you don't talk about it, what is their experience when they travel somewhere? So uh, representing Nordics, I think that is that view. So looking out in Europe, I can say that they have maybe gone a bit further uh, discussing this uh, based on what I said, that, that for us it's, it has been like it's not a topic to discuss because it's of course. Uh, it, it, we it's are actually interested. fascinating <laughs> to hear the two of yeah. you because the gap is so wide yeah. you know, yeah. between one saying there's so much more to do and the other one saying you know what, it's, it's part of our DNA now, we don't even need to think yeah, about it. Yeah, but that is why we need to think yeah. about it and, and bring it up because it is, is, there are so many things that is not visible and then you don't talk about it. Wow. Uh, so it can just be you're claustrophobic, yes. you know, and it doesn't need to be uh, big things, it's a small things yeah, that we don't course. talk about and those are big challenges if we ask uh, people to travel. Yeah. And how can we support Very our customers in that? What about you, Emasha, in uh, North America? Like, how do you see the situation going? I think there is a bit of back and forth situation, I believe. So how, how would you read it? Yeah, I think in North America, we're going through a bit of a renaissance with diversity, equity, and inclusion, especially um, since around the time the pandemic started and also with the Black Lives Matter movement really gaining a lot of visibility. Um, I think there's there's been a big push, not just for our own industry, but just many industries across the board um, that we're seeing in our countries uh, realizing, you know, we need to address some of these systemic problems. And it's kind of like Budil was saying, where sometimes you, you're taking for granted that these things are happening, but it, it's not something that um, just happens by itself. Equity is something that, you know, there needs to be a strategy behind. So we're seeing a lot of um, organizations, a lot of different industries really investing in um, a DEI strategy, which for me is so exciting to see, of course. Well, that's great. But yeah, so some more work. We need to keep talking about it. We need to keep promoting it. I think we can also say that we are very lucky to work for a company like Flex Center Travel yes. Group, which is by default, I think a bit more advanced than many uh, because we can actually be ourselves and yes, there is more work to be done, but it's good. But what, what do you see happening on our customer side? Like what, what are they, um, you, you know, do you see like when, when we sell to customers that this is some sort of concern that they have and questions around what we are doing as a supplier? Like uh, how do you see that body? So, I mean, that could be questions in the RFP, like how do you work with DEI? Uh, do you have like a DEI officer? And not just ticking boxes, but actually to give examples. Yeah, and and uh, how do you actually work with this? And, and then that could be like more concrete uh, questions about WCAG. Mm -hmm. And that could be like, can you actually book a travel online uh, without uh, touching the mouse or, or how is that working? And then of course we need to work with our suppliers to give answers around that mm -hmm. when it comes to online booking tools. It can be about uh, how do we store sensible information or do we actually store it? Uh, so we can actually help 
travelers or how do we uh, work with them if they have specific policies around um, uh, disabled people? And then, then again, uh, how would we help uh, if, if uh, it's not visible? So it's, it's uh, more about um, uh, how can we work together? But I think that most companies actually think uh, the most work is on their side, but they absolutely want to work with the team C that also see the challenges around this and work with it yeah. and, and have their own um, policy yes. or, or um, as we talk about uh, officers and doing programs around this internally. I mean, the travel industry is such a wide ecosystem, like between the airlines, the hotels. It's true that when you uh, allow people or, or even basically deliver travel services to uh, those travelers, you, you need to, you have a responsibility around that. You definitely yeah. do. And I think, you, yeah. What about you, Naomi? How do you see that happening in Asia? So largely, Bertra, I'll break it up into two. One is from the mobility space. I think most of our companies are not hiring anyone, uh, you know, differently abled or, you know, with any disabilities. And if they do, they are not the ones traveling. So that is not really in their area of concern. At the moment, we're not hearing of much. Uh, the minor, I think, injuries and people sustain, there is definitely, you know, a duty of care model in place on how do you help them with their transportation needs, etc. For women, women's safety is a massive uh, focus area. Yes. So we actually have customers asking us and concerned about, you know, what, how are you going to take care of the women, especially in the night, where do you stay, what kind of properties, are they good enough, you know, for yeah. women traveling alone, etc. So that's a, that's a big thing that we're focused on. And largely, again, the MNC and the large national customers, uh, they are much, much more uh, open and they make it a part of the program. Uh, but otherwise, the smaller ones, I think, not really, it's not really there yeah. in the conversation as well. And, you know, there's something new as, you know, I was preparing for this panel today, uh, that there are some companies actually concerned if colorblind people can access booking tools, etc. Yes. That is something, you know, yeah, I yeah. never thought of. And uh, so all I can say is uh, things are popping up. Yes. And if they're popping yeah. up now, I think it's only a matter of time before it becomes into more formalization. And, and FCM in India was quite innovative at some point because I think you were the first one to create a um, fleet of women driver for yes. women. Yes, Which yes. is, I think, quite and interesting. And the duty of care program for women in India. And I think we also have supplier partners who have women chauffeurs. Uh, you can actually, but they are so much in demand that you have to book them in advance. And um, largely, even we vetted properties on, you know, how safe are they? Yeah, because uh, you have floors to check as well. You have, some hotels have floors. Where they are no accessible yes. to the public, etc. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of work uh, did go into it, and now it's become BAU. So while earlier it was something yes. special, now yes. it's just expected of us. Which is good okay. because it means that it's, it's, a, it's a good progress. And Emasha, what would you say is the industry um, that is probably the most advanced with all those um, diversity and inclusion kind of consideration? Like, like, do you see an industry that is probably ahead of the game or what would you say? Um, there are a couple of things. I mean, I think some of the things that are coming up a lot in our RFPs, for example, um, is just looking at like our supplier diversity and also the the organizational strategy for DEI. I think what what our clients are looking for um, is that we're able to help them with you know align with their their own values and their own commitments to DEI. Um, and then the other space in terms of like actually uh, you know the the client traveler experience. Um, because the, the USA recently has uh, gender neutral passports uh, available, I think making sure that that's kind of reconciled into our systems is something that's been up, uh, come up quite a bit. Um, and similarly, just making sure that there is um, kind of a seamless booking experience for travelers who have various disabilities as well. Yeah, as we, we just spoke, so yeah. it, it, it's, it's very interesting. So I think the question is like, is there an opportunity to go further? and? And what would be your recommendation, like Emasha, because you are obviously a specialist in your field and, and you are basically waking up every day to think about this <laughs> amazing topic. So what, what would you say is, is the way forward and how we should basically think of it um, maybe differently? Yeah, for sure. I think um, 
we're, we're in a part of an industry that's been working together and has so far made some considerable strides, I think, to make travel as accessible as possible. But we're still learning. We're all making improvements and it's a continuous process. So I think my my uh, word of advice would be today is the best day to start, of course. And so not to be afraid to uh, that it's it's too late or it's too daunting of a task. I think consistency um, is key. And even if it's just small steps towards progress, that's how uh, change is sustainable. And I also think uh, one of the most important things is to establish really strong communication channels with travelers at every stage of your uh, corporate travel um, experience. I think an inclusive travel program has to be traveler led um, because addressing barriers is never going to be a one size fits all solution. we can think about, you know, how creating access for one traveler might actually create a barrier for another. Like, yes. for example, even something as simple as having subtitles in a hybrid meeting, which can be fantastic for somebody who has an auditory processing issue, um, helps them to fully participate. But on the other hand, someone with ADHD that might actually pose a barrier to their participation. So, you know, one size fits all. It just doesn't work. Flexibility is the key. And um, it's really about and listening openness, to. I think also, uh, you know, to be open about it and to talk yeah. about it, because I think that that is what many maybe employees uh, don't do, and, it's true, and they come I mean, into awkward situations. Yeah. So, and, and and you know, it's funny because when we talk about diversity and inclusion, the first thing that comes up is usually gender equality mm-hmm. and maybe LGBT rights, which are usually you know in the same line. But there is much more than that, like, and and it's basically allowing people to be themselves and and kind of be um, out with their own kind of situation and be very transparent about that. And what do we do? So, and and, and again, what sort of personas uh, would you see, Emasha? Like, you you know, you just named a few, but what do you think we can do more for those personas? And and how would you see that you know happening in our world? Sure. Yeah. Um, we have a few um, like traveler personas that I think that we've prepared just to kind of walk through an exercise. Um, so in addition to sort of creating channels for people to express what their needs are, um, which, of course, is the most important thing, there are steps that companies can do to sort of start anticipating those needs. And I think um, crafting uh, traveler personas is a really helpful exercise when you're doing it in collaboration with people who have lived experience. So whether that's a diversity committee, for example, if you have that, or employee resource groups, if you have that, um, or also just seeking third party community groups or research to help you uh, work together and bring together that insight. So you can start to think ahead and anticipate the needs um, and be able to uh, be ready to respond um, once they come up. It's very interesting. So, can, can you can you talk about a few um, situations, like, for example, non-binary, um, because you mentioned before the thing about the, the passport and all of that. But how, how do you how do you actually do something concrete about it to make this person feel respected and valued and just you know? So, what would be the, the take your take on this? For sure. If we wanted to start with um, non-binary travelers or trans travelers, as an example, um, we put together this persona of Dylan, um, who's a non-binary and transgender traveler. Um, And we know from a 2015 survey conducted by the National Center for Transgender Equality that about 17 percent of transgender travelers experience delays going through airport security um, because of gender related clothing or items that they're wearing. So uh, some of the considerations that Dylan has um, is that they travel with an X marker on their gender passport. They wear gender affirming undergarments and they also travel with a prescription for hormone hormone replacement therapy. So they're thinking about, you know, possibly higher risks of delays, higher risks of microaggressions, possibly harassment, depending on their travel destination. Um, So for creating a barrier travel, barrier free travel experience for Dylan, that would involve making sure, number one, that the destination that they're going to uh, won't give them any problems with their travel documents and making sure that they have peace of mind with that. And then also giving them some guidance on how the airline that they're traveling with um, will require them to pack their medication, for example, um, what the the TSA or any security checkpoints uh, processes so they have peace of mind. Um, And it can also include things like looking at their itinerary, perhaps if they feel safer traveling with colleagues, building that into their itinerary as well. 
and just making sure that just holistically we're able to sort of address those different types of needs. It's fascinating because it feels like you open a box and then it's like a never ending set of services and solutions that you can bring to um, these people to help them in their day to day basically. And what about because we have obviously disabled customers, I mean we, we did talk about that, like you did say that in India it's, it's actually not that common. But I believe uh, probably in North America and, and Europe because there is massive incentive from government to employ um, disabled people. So um, I think you also did something around autistic people, didn't you, uh, Emasha, like in terms of personnel and, and trying to find solutions for them? Absolutely. Um, we created this persona uh, named Lydia. Uh, and so she, like one in every 100 people or so in the world, is autistic, which means that she has a high sensitivity to light, to noise, and so bright and loud and crowded spaces can be overwhelming for her. Um, so we're thinking about Lydia having a few preferences when it helps to create that barrier-free uh, travel experience. So if possible, she prefers flying out of a smaller airport, um, booking business class as opposed to economy, certainly. And then if she's flying from a larger airport, she likes to take advantage of their Sunflower Lanyard program, if it's available, um, just to help signal to airport staff that she might need a bit more time or a bit more support with getting around those busier terminals. Um, and she also likes to have a little bit more time to herself built into her um, itinerary. So things like booking a private airport transfer her, for her um, or just scheduling downtime before and after large events can make a big difference to her travel experience. Okay, that's interesting. And what about Abiha? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So um, for, for us, Abiha represents travelers of size and also travelers who have a chronic illness. So. Um, for travelers like Abiha, there are a few different ways that we can make their experience barrier free. Um, so certainly she would have a preference for booking business class or first class airfare just to give her most room and so she can be comfortable. Um, she might also require a seatbelt extender. So she would just need some guidance on whether that's something she would need to ask in advance from the airline. Um, and then another kind of option to think about is whether she has a preference for an airline that allows her to book two seats for the price of one or who reimburses her for a second seat um, and then also thinking about any guidance that she'd need to know in terms of packing and traveling with any type of medication especially something that might need to be refrigerated for example medications associated with uh, diabetes okay and, and i think there was a last one which was about uh, mother you know who are breastfeeding um, you know and, and this is also and, and you know this is why it's interesting because now we realize that inclusion touches literally everyone. It's yeah. not like something that is just reserved for a few people in your organization. This is just across the board. So what, what about Anna? Yeah, so with Anna, we wanted to look at kind of overlapping or intersecting needs. So Anna has both a temporary and long term um, accommodation needs. So on the one hand, she has a hearing impairment, which is like a permanent thing that she lives with. And she's also postpartum and currently needs um, some extra access for while she's pumping. So for her, barrier free travel means that um, she doesn't have to make any phone calls in order to book any aspect of her trip. And she would also need to know um, any emergency numbers that she can access by text or by typing rather than phone calling should she you know, be in an emergency situation while in destination. Um, and then the other thing, which uh, is just kind of like a temporary request and she'd be able to, to make a note of when it's not unnecessary anymore, um, is that she might at some point need a private space along the way, perhaps with a fridge to depending on how long her business trip is, just so that she can do um, pumping when she needs to, and then also to let, uh, to let her, um, uh, her team know when that's not necessarily uh, an accommodation that she needs anymore. Yeah, that, that's, that's great. So, you know, coming back to our customers or what we see around us, like, do you see any uh, one which have developed like tactics or strategies which actually work when it comes to diversity? And, Maybe for you in Asia, like, do you have any hope around that or do you see some positive movement, should I say? The good news of having a not so great baseline is there's always hope. <laughs> yeah. right? That's what we all live for. But uh, as I said, change is inevitable. It has to come. The, the challenge simply is like in sustainability, carbon footprint is the same everywhere. You talk to anybody and they understand 
uh, the same thing. Yeah, and the matrix have been also globalized somehow. Absolutely. Yeah, Maybe true. the scientific calculations yeah. differ, yeah. but largely everyone understands yes. it, right? Now, take me for example, I am a Catholic in India, so I am a part of a minority religion. Most people are not even aware of those nuances, right? So, uh, if there were better ways to standardize it, uh, like typically in MNC RFPs or when they ask, largely minority means the black community, but in Asia, the minority is a totally different uh, perspective. In fact, in a lot of the Asian countries, even the native population is not that high. So it differs and if each country could manage their own set of you know rules, regulations, etc., um, and again, at the end of the day, we just, it's just important to be nice, right? Nice to everyone um, that, you, that you can. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and um, so from, um, from Asia's perspective, travel managers really just need a lot of guidance, right? And if they work more with their HR partners, because end of the day, if you talk to employees and ask them what is it that they need, because each company would have a different set of diversity, different set of inclusivity needs. Um, and that, uh, you know, as with the personas uh, which she has mentioned, I think that is key, honestly, is to work closely with your HR, which today is not happening so much in Asia. Mm. It's a totally different function. And today it's just a delivery function. It's not part of creating policies is not part of creating actual uh, very few companies which again are MNC driven but otherwise uh, we need to see a lot more of partnership with the HR and leadership in, in Asia. Mm. So that's interesting so I think we can easily say that yes we've made some progress and yes it's going to the right direction but there's still a lot of gaps and obviously some regional gaps but even in countries which are probably a bit more advanced there's still some work to do so just to finish with this panel, I'm going to ask you a very basic question, but what is your advice like to keep progressing in that front of diversity of, and inclusion? Like, what's your advice? So, Bodil. So, I think that, I mean, we are talking about people and you need to get them to open up because, again, we talk about what's visible and what's not visible. Uh, uh, if you don't have a leg, it's very visible and everyone is, is reaching out to help you. Yes. But to have the openness about what's not visible and how you can help your travelers in that mind. So, of course, you need to be a company that is, is open around it and discuss about it. But maybe then, actually, also you can work with, with um, questionnaires before you start traveling or having an, an function in your company where people feel comfortable to talk to. Uh, but it's, it's not easy because just talking about autistic, all of a sudden being traveling in business class, it's also create jealousy within the company. Ah, because <laughs> so, why this person gets exactly, a better treatment? Exactly, because <laughs> it's not outspoken, mm. because it's not visible. So then it becomes a privilege. Exactly. Mm. And, and maybe the person doesn't want you to tell why they are. So <laughs> it's, it's a very delicate mm. uh, question also. But first, I think you really need to be able to create that um, openness yes. um, around it. That is, is number one and key. And then keep on talking about it, because as we said before, DEI and travel, it's, it's um, starting to create more noise. Yeah. And I think that is really good. Good. Imasha, what's your advice? It's a marathon, it's not a sprint. And I think being able to create trust is a long-term thing and being able to reinforce um, you know that we're here to support uh, our travelers. We're here to support our, our colleagues. Naomi, what, what's your advice? So what's funny is as she was talking about uh, people getting jealous for yeah. an autistic person in in Asia, it's if if a woman gets promoted, it's Ooh, did the thing. did the company tick a diversity quota, right? Ah. So it's, so it's it still not exists. about your value. It's about it's like not numbers. a merit. So I think the first thing is uh, definitely. Uh, D and I lots more to do in terms of inclusive hiring in the first place, right? So that's where Asia at least needs to start. Second thing is increase the numbers for sure with the true meaning. Again, not just give people a feeling it's something that you're putting a tick in the box to. And then of course, um, lastly, when you have a sufficient mass, that's when I think actual action will take place. And then you can, because having it for one off person, it's still easier. But when you have a sufficient group, uh, who are not necessarily a small part of your organization, but a substantial chunk, I think then it's easier to have policies. And without policies, uh, you know, I think things don't get done. Absolutely. So, you know, you need to formalize structures, yeah. you need to put governance in place, you need to measure it, 
it's not important i mean enough just to talk about it right you yeah. need to yeah. show the change um, that you're bringing it and frankly uh, the the next generations that are coming they actually want to work with employees uh, who are friendly so if you're not going to talk about it i think it's going to be a challenge attracting the right uh, talent for sure yes for sure i i, mean, I you know i started like that in my introduction but um, you know, I made it a bit of a personal fight in the business <laughs> because I'm in a position of leadership and um, I think I'm, I'm lucky to have a voice in the business and I keep repeating to our people that we don't care about color of skin, religion, sexual orientation, whatever they are. We need just them being themselves and feeling that they can work for a company that basically supersedes all of our values basically because for me that that's what matters and Absolutely. i think again to your point we need to keep reinforcing those messages and making sure that we give to people the opportunity to be open about it and also feel respected for who they are thank you very much ladies i think it was a very interesting um panel today and uh, obviously a very um strong topic which is very close to my heart so i really appreciate the time of you today thank you bye bye